We are doing lesson 10 in the quarterly Oneness in Christ, and the uh, title for the lesson is Unity and Broken Relationships. Unity and Broken Relationships. First question as we go through this is what is the basis for a healthy relationship? The foundation, the basis, the requirements for a healthy relationship. Two, two words, what? You got it, love and trust. So let's break that down. What is love? The love that's the basis for a healthy relationship. How would you describe it or define it? Love is a principle. It's not a, a feeling. So love is a principle. Yes, the principle of other-centered motivation, concern, care, regard, desire for the health, welfare, and beneficence of another. That's what love is. I am concerned for your health and welfare. My heart is for your good. Um, so how does love function? Does love, if, if you love somebody, do you always give them what they want? If you love somebody, do you avoid taking actions that you know before you take them will cause the other person pain? Do you avoid that? Yeah. Always avoid it. No. No. no, you don't always avoid it if you love them. If you're acting in love in their best interest, many times we take actions that are protective to them, but it might harm them. Something as simple as a child stepping out in front of a, a car and you yank them back so hard it causes them a moment of pain in their arm. Right? You weren't trying to hurt them, but you don't avoid taking the action because you know it's going to hurt. Do you? No. Love does what's best. So love does what's best in the interest of others, given the context, the understood impact, the opportunity that you have, the position you hold in the person's life, all those things are taken into account. Let's talk about trust. How do you, how do you define trust? Experience tells you if you can trust the person or not. That's correct. Experience tells you, but how do you define trust? What is trust? This type of trust that's the basis for a healthy relationship. Is it not confidence in the other without any fear or doubt? Isn't that what it is? That I, have, I trust without any fear or doubt. I have confidence in you. I don't doubt you. That's what trust is. So I propose there are four elements to actually having healthy trust or confidence. Another word is faith in another. Four elements. First, the other person must genuinely love you more than they love themselves and would sacrifice for your, wel for your welfare. Thus, they won't betray you or turn on you or become your enemy. Does God meet this criteria? Yes, he does. And think about how deeply trust in God is undermined by legal theologies that put God in the role of the source of punishment from whom you must be protected. In other words, if trust requires that they won't turn on me, they won't betray me, they won't harm me, they're always for me, but now I'm teaching that this person, if I don't have some action taken, will hurt me. Think of how trust is undermined. But let's say you have an, a being, a person, who genuinely loves you more than self and would sacrifice for you, would not betray you, is that quality alone enough to establish trust? Your six-year-old child may have this love for you, and if you were in danger, they might run into harm's way in order to protect you. But do you let your six-year-old... But, but if you tell your six-year-old not to take a piece of candy or to wait their turn, do you have complete confidence or trust that your six-year-old will be able to fulfill those directions? <laughs> Even though they have love for you. So in order to actually have trust, you have to have more than other-centered love. And you have to have the second element, which is mature self-governance, the ability to reliably and consistently carry out what has been said, what they said they would do. Right? You have to have both. You have to have maturity, and you have to have other-centered love. Now, why is love for you, genuine love for you, and self-governance, somebody really has shown they can govern and do what they say, not enough to establish trust? Why is that not enough? You would think that's enough, right? It's not enough. Why is it not enough? Could a person genuinely love you, seek your good, but misunderstand God's designs and laws for relationships such that their love for you and their self-governance seeks 
directs them to control you, to rule over you, to dominate you, to di discipline you, believing with all sincerity that you are supposed to be not an equal in the relationship, but a subordinate under their governance. Could that happen? So in addition to genuine love for you, in addition to self-governance, the person has this the third element, which is wisdom or understanding of how reality works and operate in harmony with God's law. Or at least have a mindset that they love to grow and, under, and move in, in harmony with God's law if they don't fully understand it. Their heart is willing to move that way. They at least have to have that. Now, does God meet number one? He loves you more than self. Does he meet number two? He's got self-control and self-governance. Does he meet number three? Full, full wisdom. Okay? So those three are required, in my view. And then there's a fourth one in order for you to experience trust. And that is you have to actually know the person for yourself who has and possesses and practices these elements. You can't hear about it from another person and say, hey, my dad is really trustworthy and you actually trust them. You have to experience the person, have time with them. And this is where a lot of people will come to others and say, you need to trust Jesus. But they don't know Jesus. They've never spent time with him. Now, what undermines our ability to trust someone who is actually trustworthy? The person that we need to establish trust in is, has all three of these. They love you, they're mature, and they, um, and they have wisdom. If you meet somebody like that, could you still have difficulty trusting them? And if so, what are the obstacles? Lies. Okay, you guys have said many of them, so let's, let's unpack them. Um, somebody so wounded and hurt from previous experiences, betrayals, that even dealing with somebody who is trustworthy, they don't see the trustworthiness, they're suspicious and they see and project out their fears and doubts on that other person and see them through the lens of their past experiences. Second, doubting one's own judgment, having been burned in the past, having trusted someone in the past, and having been exploited or taken advantage of, they doubt their ability to discern whether somebody is trustworthy or not. So they don't wanna trust because they don't have confidence in their ability. Like, I just don't know, I just don't know. Uh, what well, you guys said, somebody telling lies and believing lies about someone who's untrustworthy is another reason that undermines trust. And then the fourth reason, being so hard-hearted and selfish and untrustworthy in your own character that you see everyone else through the lens of your own character you don't trust, you're not trustworthy, so you don't think anybody else is trustworthy either. So healthy relationships are designed by God to operate on love and trust. And love and trust are attributes of living beings. So we could say healthy relationships require healthy people. Healthy people love others more than self, have governance of self, and are wise in God's laws. We could say that, couldn't we? Yeah. Now with this in mind, let's turn to the lesson and t discuss some of the things in the lesson today.